Good morning, and thank you for being with us today. My name is Diane Ronaldo, and I have the pleasure to serve as the Executive Director of the Open RAN Policy Coalition. We appreciate you joining us in what is the first in a series of roundtables on Open RAN. Since launching three months ago, we have been overwhelmed by the positive reception we have received. We believe people are drawn to our simple message. If you standardize the interfaces at the subcomponent level in the RAN, you will drive competition, which leads to innovation, which leads to more which leads to a more robust and diverse supply chain. Comprised of 53 companies that span the mobile ecosystem and the globe, the coalition advocates for government policy supporting the development and adoption of open and interoperable solutions in the RAN. We are in a technological revolution that's driving the next generation of our economy. We are excited to share with you how we're going to help you get there. We have two special keynote speakers to help kickstart the event today, followed by a panel of experts. House Energy and Commerce Ranking Member Greg Walden, representing Oregon's second congressional district since 1999, has been an outstanding advocate for advanced wireless systems. We are extremely appreciative of his and Chairman Pallone's efforts to pass the USA Telecommunications Act, supporting Open RAN, and his long-standing work to support the telecommunications community. With that said, Ranking, Ranking Member Walden, thank you for, for submitting a video for our inaugural event. Thank you for inviting me to share a few words with you today. As you are all aware, we must continue to deploy 5G networks as quickly as possible in order for the United States to maintain its position as the global leader in wireless communications. 5G will bring faster networks as well as new devices, improve telehealth, and provide intelligent transportation systems, and you all know so much more. In order to achieve this, though, we need to free up as much spectrum as possible. And I want to commend Chairman Pai because under his leadership at the FCC, they've done just that. And recently, they commenced the auction of the 3.5 gigahertz band that's valuable mid-band spectrum for 5G. We're taking great steps. We'll provide companies with the tools they need to continue to deploy 5G networks across the United States. But when we have this conversation, we also need to talk about an equally important component of 5G, and that's the infrastructure and the supply chain that it will support. I, uh, I believe a robust market of trusted vendors for network infrastructure, particularly for the radio access network, is crucial to ensuring that providers, large and small, have access to uh, new and innovative technologies and at an affordable price. I believe that two of the best ways to develop this supply chain is to reduce regulatory burdens and provide incentives to encourage development and new entrants into this space. So by offering nearly free equipment, Huawei and ZTE have made it a difficult for trusted vendors to compete in the marketplace. As a result, upgrading equipment and software has become an unnecessarily expensive and timely process. It has also put trusted vendors at a serious disadvantage and created a space for untrusted vendors to come in and undercut the market. A limited marketplace of trusted vendors competing for the same contracts while trying to fight off untrusted vendors has also resulted in significant losses to research, to development, and to innovation. In the long run, opening up and standardizing networks will reduce these issues and decrease costs for network providers will also ease the market pressures trusted vendors currently face. Because of the current proprietary nature of networks, once a vendor is chosen, competitors are basically locked out of that provider's network. This type of closed marketplace puts pressure on vendors to accept less money for their products or risk missing out entirely. While this approach made sense in the past, innovation is pushing the market to move toward a more competitive marketplace. Now, in an open system, trusted vendors would be able to compete for contracts across an array of infrastructure items on a provider's network. The potential to mix and match the hardware and software of different vendors will reduce costs for network operators and present greater opportunity to equipment vendors. To support the goal of increasing open networks, standardization, and a more diverse competitive marketplace, I recently co-sponsored the USA Telecommunications Act of 2020. This bill will further promote and accelerate the deployment and use of open radio access networks by pumping additional funding into the marketplace. Specifically, it directs the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA, to establish a $750 million grant program to support the deployment and use of ORAN 5G networks. 
By investing in open and standards-based trusted equipment, the U.S. will be in a strong position to ensure that our networks are both secure and easily upgradable. Today, providers have to rip and replace vulnerable equipment in order to properly upgrade and secure their networks. This is an expensive and timely task for even the largest providers and an almost impossible task for small community providers. However, with open interfaced and standardized RAN technologies, providers could easily mix and match equipment from an expanded trusted vendor pool, driving down costs while still maintaining the security of those networks. To further bolster network security in the United States, while easing the financial burden of upgrading old equipment, I co-sponsored the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act. This bill requires providers to remove untrustworthy equipment from their networks, and it prohibits the use of federal funds to obtain communications equipment or services from untrusted companies. It also supplies small providers with funds to help offset the cost of removing and replacing this untrustworthy equipment. Access to this funding could help further speed up the deployment of secure and open infrastructure for small and rural network providers. It's also critical that we modernize our wireless infrastructure, permitting rules, so that network operators are able to quickly roll out these new technologies. While other countries mandate the deployment of infrastructure and manufacture the markets, the light touch regulatory approach here in the United States is built with efficiency from the ground up. Recently, the Energy and Commerce Committee Republicans, led by Leader Latta and myself, unveiled a package of 26 different bills that we believe provide the backbone for broadband infrastructure uh, and, and a permitting regime into the 21st century. There are a few things we should be able to agree upon. Network operators should know up front how much they will have to pay in fees, and those fees should be based on actual direct costs for reviewing those applications. Network operators that will spend tens of billions of dollars a year to deploy infrastructure and connect local communities should get a timely response, whether they're approved or denied. What a concept. Network operators should have clarity on when their applications are submitted, when timelines for review apply, and when they can avail themselves for regulatory relief. We also must ensure that duplicative reviews are not holding back investments in new and upgraded technologies. You know, many of the upgrades to open interface technologies will occur on infrastructure towers that already exist. Yet in order to swap out an antenna or upgrade the baseband unit, some environmental or historic preservation reviews may be required for a site that's already passed those reviews, just another hurdle to infrastructure deployment. While Congress can make some changes to help encourage the transition to ORAN technologies, it is the people here today that will actually make the promise of ORAN a reality. As more of our daily lives move online, we must take steps to secure our networks to the greatest extent possible. I'm excited by the advancements that have been made in network security over the last few years, and I look forward to working with you all going forward. We have a vibrant, world-class communications and technology industry in the United States. And as those industries continue to advance, we must allow that to happen with security in mind. So thanks for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to working with all of you in the future. All of you in the future. Thank you, Ranking Member Walden, for providing us with your thoughts on Open RAN today. Um, I am also pleased to introduce our next keynote speaker, is Congresswoman Doris Matsui from the great state of California. Uh, representing Sacramento, Congresswoman Matsui has been a longtime advocate for the advancement of technology. As the vice chair of the Communications and Technology Subcommittee, the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Spectrum Caucus, and also the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional High Tech Caucus. She has been a dedicated her efforts to supporting STEM education, which is so important as we look to create a pipeline of next generation telecom workers. Thank you, Congresswoman Matsui, for providing us your comments today. Good morning, and thank you for that kind introduction, Diane. I have worked well with Diane, both in and out of government, and she is a tremendous asset for the Open RAN Coalition. It is so great to get a chance to participate in today's event with my good friend, Energy and Commerce Committee Ranking Member Greg Walden, and all of our distinguished panelists. 
Well, I think we would all rather be meeting in person. I'm glad we're taking time today to discuss a topic that has far reaching consequences for the future of our telecommunications networks. Interoperable solutions and the radio access network or open RAN. While COVID-19 is preventing us from gathering in a room together, it has given us the chance to reassess the way we approach complex public policy, from broadband access and distance learning to healthcare and testing. The modern telecommunications marketplace is no different. While we're facing a formidable challenge, we also have a unique opportunity to hold important conversations about our shared path forward. With that in mind, I couldn't be happier to join you here today at the Open RAN Policy Coalition's inaugural event. The coalition's current 45 members represent some of the most innovative and dynamic companies in the communications technology marketplace today. With equipment manufacturers, carriers, and software companies, the coalition is well positioned to provide a holistic view of the impact of open RAN technologies. The member companies at this event serve as an important reminder of the variety of applications and technologies within this broad category. The collective experience of this coalition will serve it well as it evaluates and advocates for policies to advance these important technologies. Because as we all know, to move meaningful policy in this space, we will need a persistent and concerted effort. This coalition will play an important role in coordinating that work. That's why I'm so pleased that the coalition is committed to joining ranking member Walden and I in our efforts to amplify the importance of open RAN among policymakers. While many congressional offices are familiar with these issues generally, we have a lot of work ahead of us to ensure that members and their staff understand Open RAN and recognize its value. Fortunately for us, the central tenet of Open RAN is a simple idea, opening the protocols and interfaces within communications infrastructure will allow networks to be deployed using technology from multiple sources. One doesn't need to be a telecommunications expert to understand that moving away from closed proprietary solutions will create an opportunity for a new supply chain and ecosystem to flourish. We need to win the innovation future. That means 5G and beyond. Over the last few months, I worked hard to advance policies that support the development and deployment of open RAN technologies. In April, I joined Chairman Pallone, Representative Guthrie, and Ranking Member Walden to introduce the Utilizing Strategic Ally Telecommunications Act. This bipartisan bill will authorize $750 million for a grant program to accelerate the deployment of open standards-based 5G networks in the United States. Since introduction, language from the USA Telecommunications Act has been included in must pass legislation in the Senate. And I will continue to push for its inclusion in legislative vehicles moving through the House. In addition to the USA Telecommunications Act, I led a letter in May signed by 37 other members calling for funding to support the development and deployment of open RAN technologies. The strong bipartisan group of signers on my letter shows that there was a growing recognition on the Hill of the value and urgency of deploying open RAN. As a global race to 5G accelerates, it will be necessary for our networks to evolve. Open RAN technologies will be an important part of that evolution and can help maximize the benefits of 5G. One of the principal benefits of Open RAN will be an increase in supply chain diversity, which has significant economic network performance and national security implications. Because Open RAN relies on interfaces and hardware built to open standards 
new vendors will have an opportunity to interoperate and compete with one another. This additional supply chain diversity will give mobile operators new options when choosing the vendor that best meets their specific needs. This will facilitate more innovation, faster upgrades, and increased network resiliency. Modular open interface technology will also allow network operators to use software to take the place of physical technology like switches or routers in a process called network virtualization. With virtualized networks, mobile operators can explore new strategies to enhance network performance. One example, network slicing allows a 5G network to be optimized for different uses like manufacturing or telemedicine. Beyond network performance and economic benefits, a more robust supply chain will also produce gains for national security. Huawei is rapidly emerging as a leading producer of 5G network equipment. Strong state support has allowed it to undercut competitors and integrate its equipment throughout the US, Canada, Europe, and emerging markets. The prevalence of this equipment is a significant risk for data security and critical infrastructure. While Congress has taken meaningful steps to locate and remove vulnerable equipment from US networks, additional steps will be needed to compete with this threat globally. Open RAN technology provides a path to counter state-based actors by shifting the global marketplace toward open standards and interoperability. This will limit the effectiveness of direct state support and open doors for new trusted manufacturers to compete. Fortunately, we are already seeing examples of this shift. In Japan, a 5G virtualized network based on Open RAN is being deployed, and similar testing is taking place in the UK, Germany, Brazil, India, and other countries. The US, too, is beginning to deploy 5G, cloud-native Open ORAN technology. But for this initial success to translate into scalability and widespread adoption, we need support and coordination. That's why the work of this coalition is so important. We need to win the race to 5G and beyond. We have an opportunity to reinforce American technological leadership, create new economic opportunities, diversify the supply chain, and enhance network performance. I'm excited to work with the Open RAN Policy Coalition and look forward to a time when we can meet face to face. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to, today. to speak with Thank you, you so today. Much. Thank you so much. Congresswoman Matsui, thank you so much for your efforts in supporting Open RAN. And since my time supporting the Energy and Commerce Committee 10 years ago, you've always been a trailblazer when it comes to new technologies and supporting advancements. Now I would like to introduce Chris Boyer, the chairman of our board and who also works for AT&T. Chris, it looks like you have a great lineup today. Um, I'm excited to hear what uh, your fellow panelists have to say about Open RAN and the advancements that's being made. Looks like Chris, we're having a trouble with um, audio. Sorry, I was still muted. My bad. Um, <laughs> Technology advancements, uh, the mute button. We need to do something yeah, about that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I just wanted to thank you for having me here today, and it's a privilege to uh, moderate the panel with some of our, our my fellow members of the Open RAN Policy Coalition. So um, just to jump into things here, I'll do some quick introductions. So uh, first, I want to introduce. Um, uh, John Baker, who is Senior Vice President of Business Development at Mavenir. Uh, John is a veteran of the mobile industry. Um, he's a board member for 5G Americas. Um, and as a sought after industry speaker, he currently leads the 5G team at Mavenir, uh, which is intent on disrupting the market by transforming operator network economics. Um, second um, is Doug Brake. Uh, Doug is the Director for Broadband and Spectrum Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, he directs um, ITIF's work on broadband and spectrum policy 
and writes extensively and speaks frequently to lawmakers, the news media, and other influential audiences on topics such as next generation wireless, uh, rural broadband infrastructure, and network, uh, network neutrality. Um, third, uh, we have Brian Hendricks. Uh, Brian is the VP of Policy and Public Affairs at Nokia Americas. Um, Brian is responsible for regulatory and legislative policy and developments impact, impacting technology and innovation, including spectrum allocations, cybersecurity, infrastructure policy, intellectual property, and connected society. Um, Brian has two decades of experience in technology policy, having held senior positions in the private sector Congress with the FCC. Um, and last but not least, we have Takahiro Nakamura, who is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the 6G Laboratories at NTT Docomo. Um, Mr. Taka, Mr. Uh, Nakamura uh, joined NTT in 1990, um, and he's been engaged in standardiz standardization activities for uh, WCDMA, HSPA, LTE, and 5G um, since 1997, um, and has been the Acting Chairman of Strategy and Planning Committee um, at the 5G Mobile Communications Promotion Forum in Japan since October 2014. Um, so with that, I want to welcome all my panelists. Uh, looking forward to a good discussion today. Um, I thought we would start just by asking John first and kind of jumping into the topic of, you know, what is Open RAN? So Mavenir is a, is a pioneer in Open RAN solutions, and you've been outspoken about the promise of open and interoperable interfaces in the RAN. Um, so really just wanted to talk a little bit about you know, what does Open RAN actually entail? Uh, how do open interfaces allow a new freedom for network operators? Um, and how does it also increase uh, competition and innovation in the RAN? That's great, Chris. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, we really just start off by sort of cleaning up a few definitions and um, you know, tend to have to do this every time because there's still a, a bit of confusion in the marketplace about what is Open RAN, what is ORAN, what is VRAN. Um, you know, Open RAN, as, as the Policy Coalition is really sort of chasing and uh, promoting, is all about um, open interfaces and interoperability. And I think if you remember those two key words, as we, you know, as we go through now with the, the various bills and uh, standards, etc., you know, it's all about, you know, just having open interfaces and then those interfaces being fully interoperable. So that's no hidden parameters. You know, there's a specification for both sides of the interface so that people can, you know, build products. Um, ORAN, you know, which really started back in the US or probably three and a half years ago with um, out of Stanford University with the XRAN group and then um, got formed into ORAN when at and you know, took the chair and consolidated that with uh, the group out of China. Um, you know, really has been focused for the last three and a half years in, in producing the interface specification uh, between the remote radio unit that sits on the top of the tower uh, and the baseband processing hardware stroke software. Now, you know, the question is, you know, people ask is why, why, why did you have to go produce a new specification when, you know, 3GPP um, essentially, you know, has been producing specifications the challenge with the, the, the RAN was that the specification between the radio unit and the baseband processing unit was only sort of partially completed within 3GPP. To the extent that it really sort of became a proprietary interface um, within the mobile networks. And, and that's been around for about 15 years like that. Um, made it very difficult, you know, as the, as the number of suppliers contracted, consolidated, made it very difficult for new entrants to you know develop product stifled investment in the the, in the vc community in terms of bringing up new technology ideas new solutions so really the first step in terms of breaking down these walled garden networks was to you know produce a, a new specification which was i think gets talked about as oran and um you know essentially i think there's a you know 26 27 operators now and 150 companies focused at um, you know developing on ORAN um, with also other products etc coming out of that ORAN alliance organization um, and then you know within within open RAN we don't really define you know how to go build the RAN you know so you can do it with software you can do it with hardware um, and, and but providing you maintain open interfaces and you maintain interoperability um, clearly, you know, as Mavenir, um, you know, one of the largest suppliers of virtualized networks in the world, um, you know, we truly believe that, uh, you know, virtualization software is, is, is the way to go forward to the extent that, 
the RAN now consists of a, a radio unit on the tower, and then the rest of the implementation of the RAN is, is, is software uh, virtualized on you know standard off-the-shelf server technology. So um, you know what we're trying to do is to make the RAN look like um, you know the data center um, and, and, you, and leverage all the IT technologies that are around the world. So back to, to Chris's question, you know, how do we, um, you know, how do we see all this progressing? So, you know, the ORAN interface specification got released, you know, sort of about a year ago now, and um, you know, we're now seeing radios coming to market with those interfaces built in it, and you know, you're seeing this around the world, you know, with companies like NEC, um, MTI, you know, KMW, Gigatera. Um, Benatel, you know, all bringing products to the extent that they have a, a 7.2, that's the ORAN interface, actually in those products, um, and, and trials and even commercial networks are now being deployed with those interfaces. Um, you know, you're seeing Rapitan, uh, you, you know, is obviously a leader in um, deploying Open RAN technology um, or open interfaces, and then, um, you know, Vodafone, Telefonica, you know, very much been pursuing, um, you know, out in the lead in the sense of, of building these networks. And now, you know, as we see in the US with DISH, uh, you know, building one of the, in fact, DISH is the largest proposed open RAN network as it stands today. So, um, you know, the future is bright. I think, you know, you're seeing um, probably six, seven companies now in the radio space, you know, and that's outside of the Nokia and Ericsson. Um, you know, building radios to those interfaces. So, um, you know, the other key part of, 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 of making Open RAN successful is interoperability. Um, the speed at which the market is going to develop is, is very much dependent on interoperability. And, you know, Marinier really, you know, it throws down the gauntlet, if you like, to all of the radio manufacturers to interwork um, and, and bring their radios for interworking because that really is going to dictate the speed at which the market rolls out. And, um, you know, you'll see commercial deployments this year um, and, and it's continuing to grow. But um, on a global basis now, you know, I think Open RAN has, uh, you know, really struck the, the right accord with operators, legislators and manufacturers. And um, and it's seen as, a, as, as an industry growth factor to the extent that, um, you know, we were reviewing with some analysts yesterday some some of their latest projections, and you know, today they're sort of saying, look, you know, 10% of the RAN market by 2024 um, could be open RAN technology or open RAN implementation. So, um, you know, a lot of high hopes and a lot of uh, you know people focused at making this open RAN successful. So, hopefully, that sort of gives you an introduction, and uh, you know, as we go through today, you know, we'll uh, can expand on those points. Yeah, thanks, John. And you know, it's um, you know, my observation has been there's just a ton of momentum towards open RAN in the industry, and I think that's to some degree that's demonstrated by the the members of the of the open RAN policy coalition. If you look at our membership, you've got you know major network operators, uh, AT and T included, but also Verizon and, and Dish and Rakuten and um, and uh, NTT and um, and uh, even even uh, Vodafone and Telefonica. So it's a you know, so you got a lot of major operators, you got a lot of network. Um, um, suppliers, um, so there's you know over 50 something members. It just shows the momentum on the industry side. Um, with, with that, I want to turn to Brian. Um, so Nokia joined the the Open RAN Policy Coalition shortly after we launched, um, and over the last several months, Nokia has been pretty vocal about its support for uh, the development of open systems. Um, it made several different announcements. Um, and, you know, most recently announced that it expected to have a full suite of ORAN interfaces available in 2021. Um, so just wanted to ask you, um, you know, generally what led to the shift or if it was even a shift and um, why it's important for legacy vendors to be aligned with other players in the open RAN ecosystem. Nope. I think you're muted. <laughs> Something people have been trying to do for many years. Um, <laughs> thanks for the question, Chris. Um, actually, I, I would say, um, it isn't really a shift, um, maybe a shift in perception, but I think if you look at the the so-called big three, um, you know, incumbent suppliers of radio access network technology, Nokia has for now the last couple generations proven itself to be the most flexible and open uh, to 
to interoperability, excuse me, interoperability, experimentation, and innovation. Um, you know, we were the first ones into the ORAN Alliance. We're driving some of the specs there, including in the front hall interface. Um, we did a trial of the remote interface controller with AT&T, as you know, um, and and uh, are obviously involved in the, the Rocketon network, which uh, has been cited a couple of different times now. So uh, it's not really a, a change in, in um, you know, in our business strategy, it's I'd say it's more a change in perception and maybe a more aggressive public posture from us about supporting it. And I think what that comes down to is more from a policy perspective. We've been uh, laying out the case, uh, particularly the United States government, not just the United States government, about what is really needed in the way of a comprehensive approach to dealing with uh, the Chinese vendors that everyone has has cited uh, as as a major concern. And the way that the ORAN discussion began politically, at least in the United States, we, we began to see an emergence of sort of an us versus them and old versus new. Uh, we didn't think that's a particularly constructive debate. Uh, in, in our case, um, we do support openness uh, and, and we thought it was important for us to be able to say that, to not you know, diminish the importance of the work that the coalition here is doing, but also so that we can add our voice to, to say that while it's important to support uh, accelerating R&D for this technology. Uh, our view is, frankly, that the money that's being offered by Congress probably needs to be even larger than what they have contemplated. Uh, and but that's only one part of the of the story. It remains a scale business, and uh, we've suggested that over the longer term, any new participants in this ecosystem are going to face the same challenges that Nokia has uh, globally, and that includes a very very well financed. Uh, set of competitors from China using the development bank um, to offer below cost, below market um, financing, deferred payment terms. So those are things that are going to be major headwinds to the technology. So while it's important to talk about accelerating the R&D, we don't believe that the debate and the discussion can be exclusive to those things um, because otherwise we'll get as a sugar high. Um, we need a sustained effort to support R&D, uh, commercialization, and actually attack and address those those uh, policy inequities that are making it difficult for folks to compete globally. I mentioned the, the financing through export credit agencies, enforcement of of trade norms um, are clearly among those, and and of course uh, you know the R and D support, which we think probably needs to not just be uh, for open RAN uh, technology, but also for foundational 6G technology. So from that standpoint, since we fundamentally support. Um, and are, are working to implement the, the mission and the vision here, uh, it made a lot of sense for us to join the coalition and make sure that uh, policymakers didn't think they were really making a choice between you know, incumbent vendors who are, who are working to deploy 5G networks now and the future. That's not how we see it. Uh, we don't think that's how anybody else in the coalition sees it either. So we thought it was really pretty important to step in here. But as far as the, the commitment to, to openness, that's not something that's new for us. Thanks, Brian. It's, it's kind of funny when everybody talks, I know Dr. Bureau also in his, in his title is working on 6G. It's hard to get my head around 6G when we're spending so much time just trying to get 5G deployed. But um, but obviously, it's a great example of how the, the technology curve and the life cycles, you know, the, we need to be thinking ahead, ahead of the game, not behind the game to avoid this. Yeah, and just real quick, you asked the second part of the question, which I think is really important, which is what's the role that the, the large incumbent vendors have in, in supporting this move? And, and we think a big one for a couple of different reasons. You know, one of them is that, um, you know, we're going to need to work on feature alignment, interoperability, and integration um, in order for this to, to be successful for, for operator customers. And we change the specs and, and the releases multiple times per year if we're not working constructively and in good faith with uh, with new entrants to the marketplace, that's simply going to slow down the technology. That's going to make integration uh, more difficult. It's going to lead to performance challenges in, in the radio, uh, uh, in the RU, and, and other places. So it's really, it's critically important that the incumbent vendors recognize and embrace that this is the direction that the technology was taking us. This is the direction that our customers have been looking for us to go for some time. Uh, and, and ultimately, there's just too much momentum behind this. Um, so we can either do it and participate and accelerate it and take advantage of the opportunities this will present for us too, or, or we can work to, to slow it down, uh, which is, I think, what some people expected 
but in our case is clearly not what we're after. But we clearly have an important role in enabling and facilitating the rapid uh, interoperability that John mentioned. Great. Um, all right. Uh, Type of hero, I'm going to turn to you now. So uh, NTT Docomo uh, has already built its 5G network with open RAN vendors. And you announced last year uh, that NTT has successfully achieved uh, multi vendor interoperability across a variety of 4G and 5G base station equipment uh, compatible with ORAN standards. Um, obviously, the ability to deploy and interconnect uh, base station equipment from different vendors uh, makes it possible to select equipment most suitable for deployment in any given environment. Um, how do you see uh, the deployment of open RAN technologies impacting um, uh, NTT Docomo's future network build out as you continue to expand um, 5G coverage um, and combine 5G networks with your existing uh, 4G uh, networks using equipment from different vendors? Yep, okay. So, uh, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, we have already deployed uh, 5G with the uh, open uh, interface specifications. And uh, of course, that is good. As the previous speakers mentioned, that we could uh, have a benefit of ORAM in terms of the uh, avoiding the risk of the uh, uh, supply chain risk uh, by the specific vendors, and also as flexibility to use the uh, variety of the equipments for the variety of the environments. Yeah, actually, uh, we deployed uh, 5Z uh, using the ORAN specifications uh, for the multiple uh, vendor environments, deployments. But uh, Docomo is keen to uh, deploy the multiple vendor environments from the long, long time ago. <laughs> Actually, uh, from the maybe onesie, there we deployed multiple vendor uh, deployments achieved already. But uh, in, the, in the past, the, in order to achieve the multiple vendor uh, deployment, uh, we need to develop the, some kind of the specifications, missing specification to achieve the interoperability between the vendor equipments. But now uh, we have uh, ORAN and we have ORAN specifications that can achieve the uh, stable interoperability between the vendors. That's a very, very good for us and for everybody, I think. And especially uh, uh, even in the 5G and uh, maybe a 5G situation, uh, more and more, we need to deploy the, our uh, 5G system for the variety of environments. Yeah, at least we need to deploy the, our 5G system outdoor, indoor both, and also uh, rural area, suburban area, uh, urban area, many conditions, many environment, we need to uh, deploy the 5G system. In, for that, it is very good if, uh, if we can use the uh, variety of the, variety, many kinds of the equipment from the multiple vendors uh, so that we can have a flexible deployment uh, case by case basis. We can select the appropriate equipment from the uh, vendors, some of the vendors, and then, and also we can achieve the very stable connection, interoperability between the vendor equipment. That's so excellent. And uh, now we can, we could achieve the very stable and high quality performance on the 5G systems uh, using the ORAN specifications. And uh, for even for the future, I believe that the, we can deploy the, uh, we can extend, expand our 5G coverage using the multiple vendor equipment case-by-case uh, -case manner, uh, thanks to the stable interoperability between the equipments. That's my comments. Great, um, thanks. Um, all right, I um, appreciate that. Um, so Doug, I'm gonna turn to you, um, last but not least here on the introductory questions. Um, so generally speaking, from your perspective, um, when we think about policies that will promote uh, the development of open, interoperable, and secure networks, how do we strike the balance between uh, picking winners and losers and working with the market forces that are already in play uh, to identify what the real challenges are uh, to scaling up open RAN and advanced mobile technologies and helping operators and solutions providers overcoming those challenges? 
Yeah, great. Um, yeah, no, first of all, thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks for that. I, I think a, a great question. Um, and also thank you to the, the whole uh, ORAN uh, Policy Coalition, Diane and, and Chris for your leadership. I think this is a, these are incredibly important issues. And so I really appreciate you know, the opportunity to join you all. Uh, a great panel, uh, part of the, uh, always, always hard to, to you know, back clean up, but uh, with, uh, with you know, three home runs before me, <laughs> makes it, makes it, you taste all the pressure off. But um, no, excellent question. Uh, how do we sort of strike the balance in accelerating open RAN without, you know, coming in, picking winning winners and losers or, or uh, you know, having unfair uh, thumb on the scale when it comes to policy. So at, at a high level, I think it's really important to keep in mind, right, is that it, you have to have a plan, right? It's like even just taking a totally hands-off, leaving this to a market, that's a type of plan in and of itself, right? Um, it, to my mind, it's not a very good plan, right, to not to not have any policy involved, to not have the government take at least some action here, um, really does leave the door open to Huawei and Huawei in particular working in concert with unfair Chinese practices to continue to grow their market share, which I mean, I think it you know, has been very well discussed. We, I think a lot, uh, a lot of folks um, uh, across this, uh, this uh, environment have recognized that that comes with serious risks, both in the short term and the long term. So I, I think it makes sense. You got to have a plan, um, but at the same time, to the point of your question, right, you don't want the government coming in and, and lifting up a single company and saying, you know, this is the winner who's going to be providing equipment for the, the U.S. Um, uh, you, you know, you, you want to strike the, the right kind of balance. I would say you don't even want Congress or the administration coming in and and having, you know, really detailed uh, universal technical requirements, right? It's like there are uh, some places where, you know, it makes sense for the for these uh, pieces of equipment to be virtualized to be running on commercial equipment. There are other places, you know, in these incredibly complex uh, systems, as complex technology, where you might want a really tight coupling, uh, where proprietary proprietary solutions are the right answer, right? So it's like you need to have you know market or a standardization process that really makes those sorts of of detailed decisions. So we don't want you know some you know broad technology mandate. We don't need to be China to be China, right? It's like you don't need a detailed five-year plan. What the what I think the strategy needs to be, right, is to encourage these market forces that really are already moving through the system, right? There are already deployments, already test beds all over the world. And so how do we encourage those to kind of spin up the flywheel and really get this taking off here in the United States without, uh, without sort of, uh, uh, you know, meddling too far. Um, so I, I have you know, plenty of ideas on specific mechanisms. I don't wanna you know, go into too much detail and take up uh, all of our time. We can maybe get into to more detail, but, but, I, but to, just to run through them at, a, at kind of a high level. To my mind, any sort of ORAN um, uh, policy is really best implemented if it's a part of a much broader 5G strategy, right? It's like we, you need to get you know, all the deploy, all the, you know, policies to get deployment out there, you need infrastructure, good infrastructure policy, you need more spectrum available to the market. You also need, I think, need policies to encourage adoption, right? It's like 5G applications, the applications that really take advantage of the big jump in performance that 5G provides, you know, those require their own R&D in their own right, right? It's not nearly as simple as it was with a 3G or 4G. So to my mind, it's like you need a big broad strategy to get 5G out there and really get it being adopted and used um, in order to help drive the demand for some of these uh, ORAN uh, uh, solutions, if that makes sense. And that broader policy ideally would be coordinated you know, by a single office or even a single person within leadership in the administration. So uh, at very high level, right? Um, it, even just talking specifically about ORAN and, and more open interfaces uh, in the uh, 5G or even 4G, you know, equipment uh, market. Um, I think it's just important, even just having this, these sorts of conversations, right, to have two members of Congress on and signaling that this is an important uh, strategic component for the United States, I think is a huge, first uh, first step. I think this is really important, right? Signals to the market, signals to venture capitalists that, 
you know, this is a serious opportunity to have this sort of, you know, more decentralized, more innovative, where there's a, you know, real potential for small companies to to come in and 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 you know provide an important service to this market. So I think that's an important. Just having these conversations are are, are I'm I'm glad to be a part of it, right? Um, and then the the obvious uh, opportunities around funding for R and D, funding for test beds, absolutely support the USA Telecom Act, right? These grant programs to help uh, you know test and scale up these these uh, more open interfaces uh, in these uh, in the 5G uh, uh, equipment uh, space, absolutely uh, an important step, right? Um, I also think there's opportunities to help scale up the actual manufacturing, right? And some of the, especially in the radio space, right? The, where these are, you know, specific parts, and we're not talking about you know generic commercial um, software uh, to be able to scale up the uh, manufacturer. Uh, obviously, Nokia, Ericsson have great resources in this department, but if there are going to be alternatives, I think that there's opportunities around the uh, Manufacturing USA program, perhaps even the Defense Production Act, right, to be able to, to take, you know, where there's a mis mismatch in large operators trying to deploy equipment from very small manufacturers, be able to scale that up um, on, a, on a relatively quick basis. Uh, on rip and replace, you know, I think it's debatable whether or not it's necessary in, in every um, every instance uh, to be going after rip and replace if it's really a cost-effective means to mitigate risk. But you know, we are where we are, um, and so I, I, while I don't think it makes sense to force um, open uh, interfaces on some of those, you know, most rural carriers that. Uh, could have real challenges in trying to to navigate the um, the sort of systems integration with all this transition. Um, but absolutely, you know, if there are you know carriers that are you know replacing existing Huawei um, or ZTE equipment, uh, it certainly makes sense to have support explicitly for uh, ORAN solutions. So I think that that makes sense. A couple of quick, uh, I, I said I wasn't going to go into too much detail, <laughs> I feel like I'm droning off, but um, I do think that there's a real opportunity with the government as a lead adopter, right, especially Department of Defense, there's so many potential applications for, for 5G um, across all sort of different, um, different agencies, so I think every agency should be trying to think of how they can incorporate you know, not just encourage 5G adoption within the sort of like, you know, industry sectors that they oversee, but also within their own processes, right? Um, and there, through, through the procurement process, they can they can help encourage this uh, these ORAN, uh, ORAN solutions. Um, and one last idea, I do think it's important that we start to incorporate a lot of the, these sorts of conversations around more open interfaces into our advocacy around 5G internationally. Um, I feel like to date, um, there's been some, I feel like um, uh, at times some strong arm tactics, right, in trying to work even with our allies and and getting them to issue the the Chinese options and go with the uh, you know more trusted suppliers. Um, it, I feel like ORAN right gives us an actual alternative that we can be promoting um, internationally in a way that uh, that uh, you know. Um, yeah, I think could be more more effective over the long term. So with that, I'll I'll quiet down and uh, and look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. I mean, I certainly agree with you on many of those points. I mean, in particular, the need for a cohesive strategy and having some ownership of it. Um, you know, that that I think that issue actually transcends 5G and gets into other emerging technology areas like AI and quantum and some of the other topics that we talk a lot about in the technology policy space. And the idea that it should be part of a broader you know, 5G strategy. Certainly, I think I can speak for some of the, for at least one of the major U.S. operators that you know clearly uh, you can't really separate these issues from the broader issues around spectrum and other things that tie into 5G. And I think I think a lot of the things that you mentioned, um, you know, really fall into the category of things government can do to kind of nudge the industry along, right? Because it, you know, from just from the evidence of this panel and the members of the policy coalition, there's widespread support, you know, for moving towards open RAN, and so government, you know, can help expedite some of that and kind of nudge the industry in a particular direction that doesn't have to come down, you know, with a, with a mandate, you know, to do certain things. So I think that's a lot of what the coalition was formed to do. And, and certainly the international aspect that you mentioned is critically important because I don't think we can look at the U.S. market in isolation. I mean, to achieve the scale, you know, that most of these vendors need, you really need to be broader than just, uh, just the U.S. Uh, to do that. So uh, with that, and this, we're, we're, a policy, we're a policy coalition, so I want to ask the other 
uh, panelists if they have any thoughts on this particular question because it's all kind of interrelated to what the coalition's doing. Right. Chris, let me let me let me jump in and uh, just add on to some of the pieces that Doug was just mentioning because I think some of it's some of it's quite important. You, you know, the open RAN policy really is not just about 5G and you know hopefully you know it'll, it'll form a foundation as well for 6G, but you know it's backward compatible and um, you know, we're seeing requests even for 2G, you know, because 2G is not going to go away around the world. You know, operators are facing the challenges. They have to take out untrusted equipment. You know, what do they do in terms of a 2G solution, 3G solution, 4G solution? And, and there's a lot of 4G deployments that are still out there today in terms of new frequency bands, add-ons, etc. So, you know, there's plenty of places for, for vendors to play. Um, you know, we spoke about, you know, the interface between the radio and the baseband unit, but there's actually one other interface in the network that needs to be opened as well. And, you know, sadly, it was it was specified in 3GPP, but, uh, you know, for whatever reason, it, it's been kept closed, you know, which is the X2 interface. And, and the X2 interface actually allows you know, different vendors in the same area to work. Um, you know, the way networks are built today is that networks are built in isolated areas by, you know, a vendor. And then, you know, it's almost like you drive between Texas and Oklahoma and you drop at the Texas border because it's one manufacturer and you go over the border and you pick up on another manufacturer. And, you know, so there's things like that going on in the network still. And I think, you know, it comes back to this, you know, as much as, you know, we talk about, open openness you know we really do need to encourage that you know to, to, to really start place today you know there's absolutely no reason why um you know operators don't mandate that that the, they all the equipment should be supplied needs to be supplied with interface specifications and you know the rip and replace that's going on is a is a prime example of where you know if you could get the specifications you know you could actually replace the untrusted equipment with trusted equipment in a far cheaper manner and um you know as as as, as we move forward you know it really is about you know encouraging this this interface specification to be open and you say it doesn't matter how you build those elements providing the the, the interfaces on the boundaries of those elements are open and interoperable um, and they're the main things there. So, um, you, you know, so, so say, you know, from a global perspective, you know, we're seeing this, you know, from a management perspective, we have, we have trials pretty much in every continent now globally and commercial deployments ongoing. And it's, it's applicable for macro networks. It's applicable for in-building networks. It's applicable for dense urban networks. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of noise about its applicability, but, but in reality, it's it's you know what's what's happening is you're taking a piece of an existing network that was done in hardware and you're you're converting it to software. So there's different implementations that's going on, and and and, and this is this is you know again a technology shift as much as promoting getting open interfaces. So you know it's a great opportunity to bring these two together. You don't have to. You know you can keep. Uh, the hardware versions with the existing interfaces, but but you can also make use of this technology jump um, in in terms of leveraging you know the volumes that are used in the the IT industry and the internet industry and uh, and, and 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 changing the profile of the of the networks and the cost of these networks. So um, say I think you know the US now with Dish is 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 really taking a lead um, as we go forward, and I think you know this is really about how do we how do we take advantage of that lead going forward now? Yeah, th thanks, John. I, I, I agree with you on that. I and mean, I think I think there's obviously each operator is going to have its own plans around, you know, when it's going to implement different technologies. But at the end of the day, I, don't, I, th I think the question is a matter of when, not if, you know, in terms of moving in this direction. And that's that's indicated by all the major operators that are, you know, participating in the, I think, 23 global operators that are part of ORAN, the ORAN Alliance. and. Uh, kind of pushing in this direction, so I think it's it's just it's just a question of our own individual deployment plans. Um, Brian, um, just to turn to you, I know you had mentioned that you had some thoughts on this question as well. Yeah, I, I'm, and I was happy to see see Doug uh, go on for a while because I think it highlights uh, what I was alluding to, which is that um, you know in the in the mid and long term, there need to be multiple different policy strands that support um, the ecosystem that 
that we'd all like to see moving forward. Um, some of that is focused very specifically on the international uh, stage where I think it's fair to say Nokia has more heritage than anybody uh, else in dealing with the market conditions that prevail here um, and, and ultimately what our, our competitors are able to do in, in the market they, to present themselves essentially as cheaper at any price. So even though ORAN has a, a major CapEx advantage uh, as, as one promise, um, it, is, it is too simple to suggest that whether the Chinese open ORAN or not is determinant uh, because they have massive amounts of support um, for exporting their, their uh, competitiveness, including the, uh, the Chinese Development Bank. And I'm not suggesting that anything they're doing is, is unlawful, but um, when you can offer deferred payment terms of multiple years um, to operators, uh, it's important that that co countries like the United States and, and its partners recognize that those kinds of support streams are going to be essential for whatever iteration of the ecosystem exists to make sure that um, that suppliers, new, old, or otherwise, are able to offer um, the same kind of, of financing. Financing is a big part of the network decision, um, for particularly for operators in developing countries. So we can't ignore the international side. That means more coordination between export credit agencies. Um, the R&D part we've, we've covered uh, extensively. Domestically, I think you know what we've been talking about here is the key element of the of the ORAM policy coalition, which is to greatly accelerate the the specking and uh, opening of these interfaces to allow um, operators an opportunity to, for want of a better way to describe it, to Lego block a network where. Uh, the, the interfaces are open, uh, where you, you feel comfortable and confident that you have an organization that as new releases happen, it's a consensus-based organization that can make sure the specs for keeping those interfaces open, um, you know, that they can keep pace with that. So there's investment in that that is needed. Uh, because at the end of the day, opening those interfaces is going to allow the operator to choose from many different suppliers uh, at different layers. You'll get niche players who will come in offer hardware in a specific level you'll see people coming in and competing more comprehensively um, but but that's what you want but to make that happen and realistic we've made great progress on i think in some some of these we're up to at least version three of the specking of the interfaces there's more work to do um, and we need to make sure that as new releases happen that that we have the right organization to to keep that um, pace the other thing I, I just wanted to mention because you know for for us I think we look at the um, you know the fact that RF performance is highly dependent on a tight interworking between the RU and the baseband. Um, for some operators, given the configuration of their network, they may choose to keep moving with one supplier for all of those solutions. They shouldn't be forced to, um, nor should they be forced to an open architecture if that's really not what it interests them. And so where we'd kind of draw the line is between supporting R&D and encouraging adoption and doing things like setting aside money in procurements. Um, there have been suggestions, for example, that you should condition the, the rip and replace money Congress may provide uh, on adoption of open technologies. That's wrong. We don't support that. Um, though it, we certainly support the idea that open interface technology should be eligible. FCC should absolutely um, make that clear. But at the end of the day, None of the none of the operators who are impacted in this way have exactly the same set of needs. So we need to make sure that they have the comfort to be able to go and and select a, a solution um, that that they support. So you know, to us, you know, setting aside funds for a particular type of technology is actually a mandate, and that that we don't support. We think that's a mistake. Open means open. Uh, and then on the implementation side, the marketplace and the customers are ultimately going to decide what they want. So I think we just need to be careful and focus on accelerating the interfaces, supporting the R&D and the innovation and providing the tools for scale internationally. And those that to us is the right recipe. Yeah, and let me let me just tie up a point now there, because Open RAN is not a technology. It's a it's a it's a, a guiding principle of, of you know opening interfaces um and and widening the supply chain and, and that's the key element there and yeah as you say the operators will make a choice whether they have you know one supplier or ten suppliers um and, and that really comes down to you know the quality process if you like around the interoperability side of it um i think the other the other piece that um you know we see 
out of this is sort of the recognition of U.S. companies. You know, we, we we hear a lot from U.S. government about, oh, well, Nokia and Ericsson, I apologize, Brian, for, 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 you know, for put, putting it out there. But in reality, there are tens of companies today already playing in this space, supporting, uh, you know, the Nokia and Ericsson's and deploying technology, Intel, Cisco. Um, you know, Mavenir has been around for 15 years and we supply globally, you know, in the core of the network. So, you know, there, there are companies there that are already doing this and, and the scale of R&D budget, you know, when you add up all these disparate companies um, that, are, that are building this technology, this open technology, you know, probably far exceeds Nokia and Ericsson's R&D budget. So um, in that sense, we just need to sort of level the playing field and, uh, uh, and, and, and bring, you know, you know, a fair playing field for all these technology companies. You know, you bring Qualcomm, Intel, Cisco, you know, all these guys together with, with their respective R&D budgets. And, uh, you know, it, it's a significant strength that the U.S. is actually putting into the mobile market. Can I say something? Um, can I? Chris? But yeah, go for it. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, yeah. As John mentioned that, uh, yeah. All and specify the, not only the interface specification, but uh, some kind of guideline. That's a very important point. And uh, actually, a uh, 3PP defined a specification, uh, developed a specification for the interface, like a X2 interface or something. But uh, uh, we have uh, so many information elements. And uh, many cases, the meaning of the information elements are different by the vendors and uh, even in operators. So uh, for the, some kind of use cases, different thinking to use the inf information elements or parameters, some case uh, in the past, but the all run defined profile, uh, that is very good to have a stable interoperability between the vendors and those who are operators. So uh, that, is, yeah, that is very good, even for us, the profile, uh, defining the profiles are uh, very good approach to uh, to e to ease the interoperability testing. So uh, that is a, one of the very important point for of, of the road of the ORAM. Yeah, that is what I want to man mention. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, well, thanks. I think everybody had an opportunity on that question. So obviously, a very important topic on the policy side. Um, Let's see, we have about 10 more minutes for uh, panelist questions, and then I'm going to turn to the audience. Um, uh, so just to kind of touch quickly on a few topics that have come up around Open RAN. Uh, one issue that I've heard raised by a lot of different folks is the security element. So, you know, the concern that, you know, as, as communications networks start to look more like IT infrastructure, is that going to introduce, you know, a range of security issues um, that um, may have not been, you know, we may not see previously. And, I think the general view from inside the, you know, working within the coalition is that certainly there, there are ways to deploy open RAN in a secure way, but I'd like to ask the panelists to opine on that topic as well. So I don't know, John or Brian, do you want to start with that one or um, uh, who wants to go first? Yeah, I, I think, you, you know, again, it's, it's the more interfaces that get open, the easier it is for, you know, third party companies, if you like, to, to put their arms around the product that's being tested and, and apply, you know, test tools and test methods and software scripts, et cetera, that, you know, are being employed in the IT industry today. You know, we sort of see how secure the IT world is and, um, you know, applying all those techniques into mobile networks is terrific. And, and you know, to the extent that op even the operators will be able to say, look, okay, you know, they understand the protocols, you can keep a watch for, trusted signals or untrusted signals coming from respective boxes and, and, and you can do something about it. Um, you know, today as the networks are, you know, they're complete walled gardens and, you know, it doesn't matter which vendor it is, you know, this, this really begs the question, what's a trusted network, what's an untrusted network? And, you know, if third parties can get their arms around the interface specifications, can, can, can you know, actively monitor what's going on in the, in the information flow within those networks, Etc. Then you know it leads to a far more secure world. So um, you know we certainly fundamentally believe, and we've and we've seen it. You know in the core space. You know, um, you know Mavenir, as I say, is probably the largest supplier of uh, virtualized core networks today. Um, you know have networks out there in, in tier one operators. You know with hundreds of millions of subscribers on them. 
um, because you've got the test tools and the ability to wrap around the software elements, you know, be it the, the hardware layer, the orchestration layer, and then the application, um, you know, it does it does give a secure environment in which people, you know, people know how to handle, you know, it's nothing, nothing new being invented in here. It's allowing the tools and methods that have been developed over many, many years in the IT world, you know, to now be deployed in the, uh, in the mobile world. Yeah, it's kind of similar to how I like to think of it is, uh, you know, with 5G, there's a lot of ability to push the, the technology that we do at the network level closer to the edge of the network and, and deploy more security tools. And we, and we know what those tools are, so it's really a question of how you implement the technology and it is about that it is an either our proposition on security. I don't know, Brian, or anyone else, have anything to add on the security question? Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly does not need to uh, introduce any kind of security concern in in moving to openness. Um, I don't think we're prepared to say that we won't have those issues because as we look across the the interfaces that we're talking about opening them here, some of these have pretty good heritage. Um, whether they've been open in a standardized fashion or not, they're done in commercial terms uh, on on a routine basis when we in, in, in engage in swaps, for example. So. We have great comfort that we have a lot of information on, you know, once a, a specification is is developed, how that would actually translate into implementation without security and performance concerns. For the rest, where there's less experience, I think that's just a function of making sure we put the resources on it, the R&D, the test beds, the opportunities for people to work together um, to do that, to define the spec and make sure that, again, as releases move forward and change the the underlying um activities that that you know we keep pace but there's certainly no reason to think that that we can we cannot do this in a way that provides the same level of security and performance chris if i can add real quick i i i'm, I'm not a deep uh, security expert and so i don't not, i don't pretend to, to you know uh to go out of my depth here but but it, it my understanding right is that it does increase the complexity, right? And there can always be challenges around that. But it seems to me that it's more than outweighed, you know, first of all, giving operators a much more insight and control over what's going on in the network to see if something looks anomalous to be able to, to isolate that. Um, but but the main the main point I wanted to bring up is is I mean, not to oversimplify things, but but again, it's like to my mind, this is the best tool that we have to counter a long-term growing Huawei, right? Um, and so if if you want to think about security in a much broader than sort of like the narrow cybersecurity thread, it's like th this is a this is a really important tool for uh, long term the sort of uh, the, the security for for telecommunications infrastructure all over the world to my mind. Yeah, I mean just one, just one point, Doug, it doesn't doesn't necessarily increase the complexity. So it's uh, it's just the visibility and the ability to get around it. So I just want to wait people's mind. It. So it's not going to get more complicated. It's just going to get easier to, to see what's going on. Fair enough. Uh, defer to the experts there, yeah. Yeah, as someone who dabbles in security, um, both on the cyber and national security side, I'll just say that I agree with you there. Like if you view the uh, long-term viability and health of the supply chain as a national security matter, which I think uh, clearly is the case for a lot of folks, um, having a diverse set of vendors, which ORAN certainly, or OpenRAN certainly helps enable is a critical security issue. And I, and I would say specifically from a cybersecurity perspective, I also think that there are ways to implement open RAN, um, you know, in a way that, that can be secured. I agree with Brian, like there's always going to be, I mean, I've been in security for too long, there's always going to be some security issues, no matter how you do things. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, do you have the ability to protect against those types of things? And um, I, I think that, you know, from an operator perspective, we have pretty good um, understanding of what those are and what techniques need to be deployed to, to secure the environment, whether it's open RAN deployed or whether it's a traditional deployments, and, and certainly with 5G holistically, whether it's open RAN or otherwise, I, I would argue 5G will be the most secure mobile network we've ever deployed because of enhancements in the 3GPP standards around 5G that do things like encrypt the NZ and other other things that are being deployed with that. And, and maybe the best example of it is with 3GPP is it's a it's an iterative process, so as we find issues in the deployment, we go back to 3GPP, they update the standard, those standards can be deployed. So uh, I think it's a really positive story here around how security is going to work as we go forward. 
And it's also worth you know just clarifying that you know when we talk about security, it's all about signaling and message flows around necessarily the control of the elements as well. You know because GSM, you know from from day one from GSM with the SIM card and the encryption that's been in place, the actual voice traffic and data traffic actually has been very secure. So I don't want to leave anybody out there with any ideas that uh, you know the, the the 3G networks, 4G networks, 5G networks that we have today are not secure. You know they are secure from a, from a content. <laughs> If, I agree um, with that. Right, like things get, you know, you, you, the standards get updated. There's new techniques put in. They get deployed, you know. But that's, but the fact of the matter is, the industry is well, on, you know, is on top of this and working very closely with standards groups to to deal with these issues. Um, all right. So with that, I want to turn to um, the uh, the uh, audience questions, and we had a few of them come in. Um, so I'll go down the list of, of some of these. Um, so one of the ones that was asked um, is um, whether or not, so the, this is a question really specific to China. So there was a question about um, other than uh, Huawei stated technical objections to open RAN, you know, um, what is there to exclude China's unofficial participation in the development of an open RAN standard? and um, you know, could Huawei get a license for open RAN technology? And then conversely, there was a question raised around um, intellectual property and whether or not um, there were issues around um, around um, kind of Chinese entities having a lot of the uh, IPR for some of the technology and how that would play into the ability of open RAN suppliers to, to deliver services. So I don't know if anybody wants to take that question on, but that was one of the issues that was teed up. Well, let me just jump in on two, maybe not the whole question, but in terms of the the IP piece, I think that's another reason why I think Nokia's participation here is important because although there's a great deal of marketing around our Chinese friends, um, you know, we have more than our share of intellectual property as well. And I think, you know, this will come down to, um, you know, cross licensing and, and the things that you do to enable uh, participation in an industry to the extent that you know some of the standards essential patents for example are implicated in in the technologies that underlie um, the networks that are going to get built and it, it will be difficult not impossible to imagine but difficult I think for the Chinese vendors to pull their their IP which is one thing that I have heard um, expressed uh, because they rely on those cross licenses from us and from others as well and so I think that that danger to the extent that the questions being asked um, is mitigated to some degree um, by the, the support of other vendors who have vast patent uh, portfolios. And then, you know, as I'm sure John will attest, there's a, a great amount of uh, proprietary patents that are held by the, the other companies who are looking to jump into this space as well. And so I'm not as worried about an escalating patent conflict um, being an impediment here. I think there's too much to be lost um, on all sides, but certainly from from the Chinese side. And then the other thing that I would mention uh, again is to just kind of circle back to this idea that um, you know the Chinese market's an important market. It's an extremely large market, and I think a lot of the comments that have been made around um, you know ORAN will will they won't they will they support it won't they support it? I think our question has come back to do they even need to? Um, because I don't think we know the answer to that question. I think it's a pretty safe bet after spending the money and the time that China has in cultivating domestic champions, it's not about to just lay down. Um, so if they need to embrace open RAN technology in order to remain competitive and in, in, in the rest of the or open RAN um, standards in order to, to remain competitive, I think it's fair to say they'll probably do that. Um, but again, I don't want to ignore the very real non-domestic side of this equation, which is that they may not have to because they're still going to be able to offer extremely attractive packages um, to people, um, you know, heavy subsidized rates, commercial dumping, uh, you know, deferred payment terms and things that that will make their classic stack extremely attractive. So I think we just have to be cognizant that simply you know, opening interfaces is not a magic bullet um, in terms of, you know, scale and being able to provide a check on, on Chinese dominance. And and I think too often in the ORAN discussion, we are ignoring that very real threat that there need to be far more tools than just the R&D support and the, the interface specking. 
Yeah, I think I think the, the you know the IP as, as as Brian said, you know that you know in, in some respects amongst the manufacturers, this is business as normal. You, you know that uh, you know clearly through the the, the standardization process, you know companies are building their IP portfolios, there are balancing portfolios. You, you know clearly, you know we have strength in numbers, if you like, in terms of sorting some of this out. Um, you know, we should, shouldn't necessarily get too hung up on the IP, uh, you know, providing, you know, it's, it's fair and reasonable terms, you know, as soon as anything starts to become blocking, then, uh, you know, then we start to see a problem. But this has been sort of, you know, baked into the whole 3GPP process, if you like, from day one. And, uh, you know, to the extent that I would honestly try and encourage a global marketplace, as soon as, as soon as we try and put barriers up effectively between countries and, companies essentially you know to, to to lose what was set out to be you know you know I, I was lucky to be at the beginning of gsm you know showing my age now but but you know it was all about generating a global marketplace and clearly we've done that and we shouldn't necessarily try and tear it apart i think you know all we're trying to do here is open interfaces and widen the supply chain again to the extent that there's fair competition in the marketplace and you know and i'd argue opening these interfaces will put competition in china as well you know let's 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 look at it the other way around as well you know let's encourage you know smaller companies in china to compete with huawei and zte you know it's 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 really about how to broaden that ecosystem you know because also respected that you know over the over the last 10 plus years a lot of the technology um, manufacturing and r d even has migrated to china and you know in this process so, you know we've got to through these government aided programs we've got to bring the supply chain back and we've got to bring the design capabilities back you know it, it's in a sense you know seeing how everything moved east and now we've got to move it all back again um you know is a real necessity and if you look at you know where where the major r d centers are for um you know, for some of this technology, and a lot of it for radio, from a radio perspective, is in China, and, and that's a, a you know key resource that, 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 that and a key, key technology that we've got to bring back to the U.S. So, um, you know, so, so to that extent, you know, it's making sure that you know, as U.S. Inc., if you like, you know, how to bring all these patents together, take fair advantage of it, and um, you know, I think back to the first part of your question, Chris. You know, Chinese companies are participating in Iran and. Uh, um, you know, we've seen a lot of momentum with Chinese companies, you know, doing interoperability testing and stuff with um, other end product. You know, it really comes down to their ability again to compete in the Chinese market. But uh, you know, we'll see how that comes out over time. But I think you know, there's a lot of work to do. You know, just opening up the U.S. market for open interfaces and uh, and, and 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 you know, so so there's more than enough for everybody. I think it's fair to say. Well, I think, I think the other side of it is that if you're talking international standard, I mean, by definition, that means it's international. So there's no, no need to, no reason to preclude any one particular entity. And, the, and so if, you know, if, uh, and there actually are, um, you know, Chinese entities are looking at, as you mentioned, with some of these different technologies. So uh, it's a question of, though, if it's standardized and opened and, and you know, then it, then it creates an environment, I think, where multiple entities can play in that space. So that, that's the key. And you're not trying to foreclose someone's opportunity, but it gives, it gives a, as, a, as an operator, it gives us a lot more options. Yeah. Um, on a related note, another question we were asked was, um, what are our thoughts on, there's been a recent swirl of, uh, you know, new decisions coming out of Europe. I don't know, Doug, if you want to tackle this one, but uh, there was a decision in the UK that came out a few weeks ago. There was a decision made in France recently um, around how they're going to uh, deal with their their uh, 5G networks. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on, you know, on those developments um, and how they might impact um, Open RAN. But um, that was one of the questions that was teed up by the audience. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I have uh, you know specific comments for any one of those if it's worth going in depth uh, on on each particular country. But um, and others might might have uh, you know. Uh, 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 more detail on this, but my understanding is that there's a a real challenge, especially in trying to get interoperability between existing Huawei 4G equipment and new 5G deployments. And so, for any country, uh, particularly Eastern Europe, that that has widespread existing deployments of Huawei, there's I mean a, a a huge economic cost to try to transition away from that in a sort of hard cut, right? Unless we're able to successfully open up those interfaces. In a way that that um, that has a you know real uh, ease of interoperability, and so I think that uh, that that will be continue to be a, a major driver in different countries' decisions 
um, in, in which direction they go. And that's why, to my mind, rather than just sort of, you know, insisting on a security threat um, and, and trying to, 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 to sort of strong arm countries into, into coming along with the U.S. in, in, uh, in foregoing Chinese equipment, uh, it would be much better if we were to go, uh, go this route and try to promote uh, these open interfaces and, and try to find a way to, to, to have, you know, uh, interoperability between existing 4G networks and, and new 5G equipment in a way that doesn't, doesn't have uh, quite as much of a uh, performance impact as, as it does today. I'm sure, I'm sure others um, have, uh, have more thoughts on the matter. Though. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a performance impact per se. I, you know, I think, you know, it's uh, clearly, you know, the operators are looking at Open RAN as a solution. You know, a number of the RFPs, RFIs that have come out over the last year have all been very much focused at Open RAN type technology. Um, so, you know, it's clearly in the forefront of their minds. I think the big question is how do they pay for some of these rips that have got to go on in, you know, the UK, France, etc. You know, I think, you know. Graciously, the U.S. government is paying for the rip and replace for the tier two, tier three guys in the U.S., but the same is not reciprocal in in, in Europe. And so, um, so there's a lot of questions around that. But um, you know, again, you, you know, I think there's this just recognition that that there's this need to widen the supply base, and and an open RAN is seen as the mechanism for doing that. So, um, you know, whether at the end of the day they end up you know going back to the same vendors and buying more of the same vendors, you know, who knows? But I, I, I you know, I can almost um, put money on the fact that they're going to widen the supply base, whether whether people like it or not. You know, because they are so at risk in in going back to to maybe you know staying with even one vendor. You know, some of the operators now are potentially just one vendor networks. Um, so you know, how do they how do they improve their competitiveness and their they get the cost out of the network? Because at the end of the day, it's the end user that's going to suffer um, by you know having high cost, high burden networks. Great. Um, we had a series of questions come in um, around performance, and I know, John, you just briefly touched on it a second ago, but, um, you know, there, there was a question about how, you know, what's the expected performance of open versus closed systems, um, whether or not there's a, a, a repository for performance data. Uh, there was also a question about who takes responsibility for the end-to-end -end performance. I think this goes, I think that kind of goes to the um, kind of systems integration concept that we've talked about, I know, within the coalition around how do you manage that environment. I don't know if any of the panelists want to opine on kind of performance and uh, integration and man overall management of an open end system. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're right in the front of it. And, 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 you know, and I think the first off is that from a performance perspective, you know, you can get the same KPIs. In fact, you will get the same KPIs, you know, for an open RAN system as you will as a closed system. And, um, you know, as much as the FUD that's around in the marketplace, you know, new vendors coming into this marketplace have um, have the feature sets in their networks to 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 to, to give that same set of standards. And um, you know, and the way to look at this in, in any in any technology shift, um, you, know, you know, things are going to go right and things are going to go wrong. You know. Um, you know, I was right at the beginning when Nokia really entered the mobile market space completely. And, you know, to that extent, there were ups and downs and, you know, sleeping cells as you can go through the history of what's gone on in mobile networks. And at the end of the day, you know, open RAN companies will achieve the, the same KPIs and, and are doing so. And, uh, you know, I think Marinier has even published in, in some of the webinars some of the KPI statistics. And so, you know, again, a lot of this is sort of anti-marketing in terms of just hanging on to existing business models and stuff like that. So, um, you know, clearly there is disruption going to happen. There is market shares going to shift around, um, but nobody should look at it as a, as a negative. You know, it's, as I say, at the end of the day, this is the reason why we get up in the morning and come to work. You know, we enjoy the fun of solving these problems. And, you know, at the end of the day, it comes back to, you know, is the consumer going to benefit out of this? It's not just a science exercise. It's a it's an exercise in getting cost out of networks and allowing um, mobile customers to to have a better service at a lower price, almost. You know, it's it's or, or more features that will give better technology usage. You know, it's not a um, you know it's not a technology drive and it's not a science exercise. You know, there's a lot of business reasons for doing this. Yeah, I would just say, look, and I mean, I'm sure John will disagree with my point on this. It this this is very much to be determined, but it's not going to be determined by 
the technical and specification. It's going to be determined in the implementation and the integration. And if we do that well, then you can you can have very high performing networks, you know, with with no security issues, as I mentioned before. But you know, we just don't have the heritage yet to to be able to say that that it's it's a hunt. We shouldn't be complacent. Let's just put it that way. I think it comes back again to making sure we have the resources, the test beds, the the, the money to drive the R&D, the specking, make sure you've got the right body that, or bodies that can keep pace as the releases change and update, uh, that there isn't the lag and, and making sure that things um, stay, stay on course. Uh, and then I think there will be challenges for um, implementation and integration for some of the small operators. It's not that it can't be done. It's not that they need sort of, you know, take, take, uh, uh, performance uh, degradation, but they may need help. Um, and you know, there's a lot of integration work we do when we deal with our big customers that if I'm not gonna be selling as much, it's unclear that we're gonna you know, eat the cost of that. That may be a, an exogenous cost and there may be support programs that are needed for that, et cetera. But I think it all comes down to integration um, and, and implementation. And there's no reason that there has to be any performance um, you know, issues moving forward, but we've got to be smart about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from Docom point of view, we also uh, see that uh, open run is very good for the to achieve the better performance and also uh, innovation of the technologies uh, to be implemented in the our network. And uh, yeah, uh, hopefully uh, we can identify, we can find a nice uh, equipment or nice software to improve our network, that that should suit for the our environment, including the spectrum policy in Japan, especially. So uh, you know, it is good to to have a good flexibility to improve our system, uh, not only for now but also the uh, further enhancement of the five G system and even for the six G. Great. Um... Let's see, one more, a couple last questions. So one was, and this might be a quick one, but there was a question about whether or not we saw an ORAN small cell that could work with the 5G macro network supplied by a tier one vendor. Um, whether we think that's a viable um, you know, a scenario down the road. So I don't know, Brian, if you want to start with that one or? Start with start with the economist and the lawyer, and not the the business development and engineering guy. Um, I, I'd probably have to punt. I'd I'd like someone at Nokia to be able to answer that. I'm not familiar with where we are technically in the staging on that. Okay. So it sounds like it's something that still needs to be looked at. And then the last question I had was, um, this I think we've touched on this one a little bit already. Um, this is really a policy oriented question. It's Basically, the question is like, how do we promote ORAN internationally? I think Doug, some of your ideas actually touched on that. But you know, do we do we encourage uh, foreign governments to promote or build in open networks, or is there a role for foreign regulators, et cetera? So uh, I think we've, we've been hitting on that, hitting around that topic. But um, so maybe what I'll do is to wrap things up since we have a few minutes left. Just ask each of the panelists to offer any final remarks on the issue of how to promote ORAN in the policy arena, whether it's internationally or domestically in the U.S. Um, we'll just do a round table. So I don't know Doug, if you want to start and then we'll kick it over to uh, uh, Takahiro and then um, and then um, uh, John and Brian. Sure, yeah, no, um, yeah, I, I, again, thanks for the opportunity to be uh, be uh, here on the panel with you all. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to join you all. Um, yeah, I go back to, to sort of my, my initial comments where I think that, to my mind, this always will be best implemented if it's part of a much broader 5G strategy. Um, and so I, I would encourage, you know, anyone thinking about these issues to, to keep that in mind. Uh, I know the, the uh, NTIA, right, they've, they've initiated a process to develop a, a national strategy to secure 5G. And to some extent, that incorporates a lot of these issues that we're talking about. But I think even broader to, to, to have a sort of point person on deployment and particular adoption to help drive the adoption uh, within each of the individual agencies. That will help, you know, bring along all of the, the opportunities that we've been talking about over 
So, so I mean, that's a big sort of overarching idea, but then the, the test beds R&D, that's sort of an area where I feel like that there's widespread agreement, right? There's almost, you know, universal support for uh, at least some, uh, you know, a big pot of money to help drive test beds to scale up these systems and identify where there are real challenges that need to be overcome. And so uh, to my mind, that's, that's like, those are the obvious places to start, right? A, a single person running point within the administration to help drive this, these policies and also, uh, you know, a pot of money, um, whether it comes through uh, NDAA or U.S. Telecom Act, USA Telecom Act, um, uh, as long as there, you know, it's a real money for, for R&D test beds to help, to help scale that up. Um, uh, you know, plenty of other opportunities, but that's, I think, uh, to, for me, the sort of uh, the, the big takeaway where there's agreement, where there's uh, progress to be made. Great, Takahiro. Oh, you asking me? <laughs> On yeah, the... I'm just gonna do that quick round, round, round rather than what was the close up. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, for the closing, okay. So uh, in that case, the the operon is a, a very essential part to promote a very flexible deployment. Yeah, so uh, it is important to spread the open specification uh, to be deployed all over the world, of course. And uh, testing, testing is also very important, I think. And also I hope that uh, support from the uh, governments uh, in terms of the economical uh, manner or tax manner, that should be nice. and. Uh, uh, Japanese governments are positive for the open round also, so uh, I hope that uh, the open round, uh, open interface can be uh, spread in Japan and also all over the world. I hope. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Yeah, so I, you know, just to summarize, I think you know, open round is all inclusive, you know, and it should stay all inclusive, and to the extent that you know it doesn't exclude anybody from participating, you know, in investing in the technology. Um, it is not a revolution um, in the sense that, you know, it's not going to be a big bang theory in the sense that it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to evolve into networks and, you know, should be the founding principle, if you like, for specification processes and uh, that, 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 that are ongoing. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the speed of which now, you know, open RAN sort of takes place on a global basis is going to come down to the cooperation of the companies that are participating. I think, you know, We've seen it with the Open Rank Coalition, you know, to get 52 companies, you know, behind a common theme of open interfaces and interoperability. And I think if that, that momentum can stay there, then I think, um, you know, it'll be a huge success. And, uh, you know, we can sit back in 10 years and, and look at how the industry has changed um, through the benefits of groups like the Open Rank Coalition, ORAN Alliance, etc. Um, but it's absolutely necessary to change. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be stuck in... Uh, you know, we're going to be stuck with, um, you know, networks that are very much the same and, and not taking advantage of technology. So, um, you know, I think it's the most turbulent time in the industry, but uh, it's a great time for engineers, great time for operators, great time for, for policymakers. And I think, um, you know, we should take advantage of that. Great. Um, Brian, you get the last word. The last word. I'm standing between people and lunch. Uh, well, first, thanks uh, for for inviting us to participate, and thank you for everybody who who is uh, listening and and will view this later. Uh, you asked the question, Chris, in an international context, and I don't want to sound like a one-string banjo, but I just want to come back and and note a couple things that everybody should keep in mind. Um, I agree with what Doug said earlier that we have long since moved past the the hard diplomacy stage. Uh, where the U.S. has expressed concerns to a, a lot of countries around the world about high-risk vendors um, and shouldn't buy certain things. I think now the message needs to be, and by the way, you don't have to, um, and and to support that concept in, in a variety of ways. I mentioned I think it is going to be critical um, in the longer term. It may not be the shortest term problem people are thinking about, but this will remain a scale business at a, at a major um, at a major level, and I think you can anticipate adaptation um, by Chinese vendors. Uh, and so, providing the full range of tools that will, and even doing it on a multilateral basis with other countries like Japan, and uh, to make sure that those resources are flowing. Um, there's an old saying, "Money buys degrees of freedom." I think that would be a a good way of looking at this, and providing domestically uh, the right amounts of money 
to allow acceleration of R&D. Test beds is a great thing. Nothing will help better uh, in answering people's questions than showing uh, you know, technology at work um, seamlessly, interoperably across vendors, supporting live networks. So it's about making sure we provide enough funding. We, we don't know what we're gonna get yet in the US election. Um, we don't know whether we'll have the same administration, a different administration, a different Congress. So I tend to like to focus on the things where there's bipartisan consensus, where we aren't gonna get a drop off or a lag next year if you have a change in administration. And you know this issue set needs to remain a first 100 day priority and not slip you know, to the back of the pack. And to do that, I think focusing on the R&D side, the test bed side, the making sure that we've got the right things in place to support, um, you know, consensus and, and evolution of, of the specs as they need to happen. Those are key. And then you can you can adapt the rest as you see the, the changes happen in the marketplace. Um, and as you get feedback from European and Latin American and Asia Pacific operators about what do we need to make uh, this an attractive uh, approach for us? You know, is it funding of a different kind? Is it to help with you know replacements and swap outs and, and other things? But for the meantime, I think there is huge consensus within the ORAN coalition of companies on the R&D side and, and some of the other support mechanisms that should be bipartisan and should be able to continue into next year. So I think we keep focusing on those things. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening to us today and for tuning in. Um, I think, as Diane mentioned, this is the first of um, what we hope will be um, several different events hosted by the Policy Coalition. We'll be exploring um, uh, different topics and other issues around the Open RAN as we move forward. Um, so looking forward to the next event. Um, and with that, uh, also the uh, just mentioning that the event will be, there will be a recording posted on the Open RAN Policy Coalition website. Um, shortly after this event. Uh, so if you have to go back and refer to it, that'll be posted there. Um, with that, I think we are done. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys. Everyone. Great job. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.